What's up, everybody, and welcome to the Falcons Final Whistle podcast. I am AtlantaFalcons.com Digital Managing Editor Scott Bear, and I'm here with the Crackpot team from the team website, Tori McElhaney, Falcons beat writer and football analyst, long-form features reporter. Man, these titles are fun. Chris Rim is also here, and we are here to break down a 34-30 to loss, the Falcons' loss to the Washington football team. We are still here at Mercedes-Benz Stadium. They have not turned the lights off on us yet, and we are going to take the time over the course of this podcast to break down what happened and what it means in totality and try to make sense of everything that fans saw here at this field. But before we get to that, we do have to give a big thank you to our sponsor, Microsoft Windows 11, the official operating system of the NFL and the Atlanta Falcons. The all-new Windows 11 is here to bring you closer to what you love, like this Falcons Final Whistle podcast. Learn all about the awesome new features of Windows 11 at Windows.com. And before we start our Falcons Final Whistle over the course of five-minute quarters, there will be four of them, and we're going to break this thing down. Tori, generally speaking, what were your thoughts about this game, especially how it ended? Uh, I just feel like I've seen it all before, and I know we'll get into this, but... Y'all can ask Chris. I called it. I knew it was going to happen. You did. I saw it happening. I saw how things were unfolding, and I was like, I've seen this before, and I'm about to see it again. And I hate to tell y'all, but I was right. Yes, you were. Mm -hmm. I mean, my my thoughts are just devastating after last week. You think maybe the Falcons, even though it was a – injured team in in the Giants not the the best team but they figured out how to win a tough game they, and on the road they figured out how to win a game something that they couldn't do that they didn't do last year and then this week you see the team that we saw last year right so that 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 was my kind of takeaway from today yeah and we're going to get into a lot of different details about that, including the fact that we listened to what you guys want to talk about, and we're going to incorporate that into the course of this podcast as we go through a number of topics, and we're going to get to the first one here in the first quarter. The first quarter is now underway, and we have five minutes to talk about the way this game ended especially and what to make of it because the Falcons had an eight-point lead with about four minutes left, they coughed it up, ended up losing this game in a fashion reminiscent to recent seasons, especially a 2020 campaign where they let late leads go constantly. You guys all remember the Dallas game and the Bears game and the Chargers game and the Lions game, and we can go on and on and on, right? So the question is, is it fair and appropriate for Falcons fans to say, here we go again. I tried to delve into that in my column at AtlantaFalcons.com, shameless plug number one, <laughs> um, and watched a lot of Chicken Little videos, true story, because I thought, is the sky falling? Are fans screaming that the sky is falling when it's not, or is it really? And that's kind of how I tried to approach it. I think the answer is we don't know yet because we don't know how this thing is going to go. But, Tori, you covered this team last year. You experienced all those games that I just talked about. Is it fair and appropriate for fans to go right back to having those 2020, 2020 flashbacks? I think it's incredibly validated that fans feel that way because they have yet to see anything that can help them feel differently. I, I think that's what it all boils down to to me is like, you know, we saw so many similarities to what happened last year to what happened tonight. And, and, and it, it, at the end of the day, I feel like the fans kind of understand like, yes, this is new, but it's like when it happens in a similar way, when a loss happens in a similar way to what they've seen it time and time again, like you can't help but to automatically be like, going back to that headspace of what it was in 2020. And I think for fans, it's validated for them to feel that way. Now we can sit here and say all day long, like, oh, <laughs> this is something that's going to get turned around. And like, but we don't know that. We don't know what the outcome of the next three, four years is, because I do believe this is a three, four year. I don't want to use the re word rebuild because I know that's a hot button around here. But transformation. I, yeah, a transformation, whatever, whatever <laughs> a you want to call it. A rebirth, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Rejuvenization. <laughs> I mean, we could really get into the, the terminology of it, but I think we all know the gist of what I'm getting at. And, and so for the fans, it's just kind of like, well, dang it. Like, 
I really wanted this to be different, but it's not different yet. And right. it's tough to get out of that headspace. Chris, where do you think, just looking at this game as an individual entity, where in the fourth quarter do you think that it went sideways? Uh, well, I think specifically in, in the fourth quarter where it went sideways was when the pass that was lobbed high into the end zone, that was in the fourth quarter when the mm-hmm. pass was lobbed high into the end zone yeah. and then what should have been a, an interception, which I think from that point probably – because it felt – to me, at least, it felt for a while like the Falcons were leading by a lot more than they were actually mm, right. leading by. It felt like the game was essentially theirs to me in like the third quarter, and they were playing well. But the but Washington just kept like converting on third down, Gosh, <laughs> and, like, converting yes. on third down, and then that play to me is when things changed. Yeah, and then things started going downhill and downhill, and then what we saw as the result. (laughs) I think like that moment specifically, it was one of those where the wind really gets knocked out of you. Like I was sitting there watching it and I, you know, you see Dante Fowler kind of, you know, almost, I felt like he almost had the sack. Like I thought it was, I thought he was going to be down. Like I, I was like, that's it. Like that was a great play, whatever, whatever. And then the ball floats into the end zone and you have TJ green at the back, just kind of standing there. And then like they, it's a touchdown. And I'm like, what in the world? world like it was yeah. a very much like takes the wheels uh, like off of any type of mobility that the Falcons had at that point I think it just like the motivation the the momentum was just gone after that and I think too as a fan if you if you watch that if that's me and I'm watching that I'm just gonna think oh here we go again mm-hmm. and that's exactly, exactly what where happened. everyone's head went and everybody it. yeah and but the wacky thing ab- about this is that if we look at the Giants game the the Falcons go down and score they the defense forces a short drive from the Giants and then they go down and score again. In this game, Washington goes down and scores. The Falcons offense does literally nothing with their opportunity. We're going to get into that later. And then Washington goes down and and, and scores again. It was the it was the bizarro world version of the Giants game. It was yeah. exactly the opposite of that. And the question is, if nobody's willing to assume that 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 the Giants game means that they have it all figured out. How can we assume that this Washington game means that they're going to revert right back to old things? So I'm not saying anyone's wrong for feeling the way that they're feeling. I'm saying exercise a little bit of patience before we make a final judgment call. The second quarter begins with a deep dive into what was a very short offensive series for the Atlanta Falcons that was sandwiched between two Washington scores that ultimately decided this game. And you look at the at the playlist, it's not very flattering. Mike Davis off the left end, minus three. Mike Davis left tackle, plus four. Matt Ryan short pass to Mike Davis again for five. Then a punt by a guy who doesn't punt because the punter was unavailable. That sequence where the, the Falcons had an opportunity to be closers. And you can be a closer on offense by bleeding the clock, by running the ball well, by being efficient and just keep those chains moving and demoralize an offense and put a lot of weight on a relatively inexperienced quarterback uh, to, to go win it. Um, the Falcons didn't do any of those things. Uh, Tori, it sounds we, we've talked about how, how, how pivotal that was. Uh, and you seem to know right then that there was trouble afoot. Yeah, I, well, it's so funny, and I talked about this at the top of the pod, but I was sitting there, and I watched the Falcons go out there to take over with three minutes and 52 seconds left, and I turned to Chris, and I kid you not, Chris, can you back me up on this? Yep. I turned to Chris, and I said, they're going to go three and out right here, and then they're going to lose this game. And I said that fully knowing the issues of, you know, going back to that first question, we're talking about issues from 2020 and kind of bleeding over into 21. It's because that's what happened all the time last year, all the time. It was because the offense couldn't convert a first down. That was such a huge problem. And it was a problem on first and second down where they were getting themselves in a situation where they had a long third down to convert. And and that's kind of what we saw. We saw Mike Davis get dropped for a loss of three on first down. And so you're all, you're already behind the chains. You're already putting yourself in a really tough position to convert a first down. And then the fact that it ended up happening the way that it did, where it's like they had a three and out and then Washington gets the ball back, goes down and scores with two minutes. It's just like, this is just the same thing again. It's the same thing happening. And the fact that I was able to be like, yo, Chris, watch this. Like, (laughs) I'm not proud of it that I was able to do that, but it happened. Yeah. The 
the wild thing is the Falcons were 10 for 16 on third down going into that. But it, it's all about how you perform in the clutch, how you perform when it matters most, and they weren't able to, to, to get those things going. And Chris, here comes a mildly unfair question, no. but I'll ask it anyway. It, it seems like a lot of people on, on social media, and this can just be a, a discussion point. I don't want to single you out, but just it seems that there's a lot of discussion about maybe getting a little conservative uh, with the play calling there. I'm not huge into second guessing what Arthur Smith is thinking, but nonetheless, we saw some conservative play calling that, that wasn't able to get 10 yards. Do you take any issue there? Guys, do you think that there's any problem with how the Falcons went about that series or was it more about e- execution? No, I th- yeah, it was about execution. I think calling the, I think the play, the play calls were fine. I think you want to run the ball there. You want to take time off the clock just in case you don't get the first down. And then I, I think, Thinking about if you don't get the first down, you want to give Washington as little time as possible to move right. down the field. So I, I, I think the calls, I think the play call, conservative is fine there. I think, but mm-hmm. I think Cordero Patterson should have been on the field in that situation uh, before Mike Davis. Not saying that just because he was the hot hand. If you're if you're mm-hmm. playing basketball or playing football yeah. and someone's a hot hand, give him the ball. Mm-hmm. So today, every time Cordero Patterson got the ball, good things happened. And good good things happened with Mike Davis too. I'm not because he scored a touchdown. Obviously, there were only people to score his touchdowns right, yeah. today. But I think I really would have loved to see maybe on that second down throw a screen to Cordero Patterson or you know do a, a stretch to Cordero Patterson. And, and so that way they're both touching the ball. But I think as far as the play calling, I think the play calling was fair, and smart. It just just the execution wasn't there, and that and that happens. And, and coaches kind of take heat during uh, during yeah. times like that when things don't work but not having Patterson out there for that series and and even on that final Hail Mary did, did that make you raise an eyebrow Tori it at it all uh a little bit but at the end of the day I mean I, I and maybe I'm coming at this from a, a different perspective I've never because I was a coach's daughter I've never <laughs> been one to coach like Mac. question quest, yeah coach yeah. shout out coach Mac. Yeah. Uh, I've never been one to really question why certain packages are in at sure, certain right, times, right. unless it's blatantly obvious, like that someone should be in, like Kyle Pitts should actually abso- absolutely be in for Hail Mary, like right. for sure. So, I mean, yes, I could raise some eyebrows and I probably do, but I, I tend to kind of just be like, you know what? They had a plan. It just didn't work. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And then I think that's ultimately what happened is the plan didn't work and they had op- op- opportunities to do better. They probably could have and should have done better. Uh, ultimately, they fall short in this one. We move on to quarter number three, and we talked about offense in the previous period. Now we're going to delve into the defense, especially late. We're going to talk a little bit about this defense as a whole, but more specifically, let's start with the secondary here that we've seen veteran safeties uh, back there in Eric Harris and uh, Deron Harmon a lot. We've seen Jalen Hawkins mix in. What was your guys's evaluation of that safety spot of that defensive backfield? seems like there were some opportunities that were missed for those guys to make big plays uh, that ultimately hit the turf. Yeah, I think it, it was one of those things where it's like, Eric Harris had two opportunities to come up with a big interception. Deron Harmon had, I think, one opportunity in the end zone to come up with an interception. And these are – they're not, like, balls that are, you know, not catchable balls. Like, they were in their hands. And I think that is what's tough is when you have these opportunities and you don't follow through with them. And it was something that Arthur Smith even spoke about after the game and he mentioned these, you know, sure, quote unquote, like interceptions that they dropped. And and the fact that he kind of brought it up a couple of times was very interesting to me because I think it goes to show how important those moments could have been for the overall scope of the game. Yeah. And I think, I think going off of that point, I I think a positive for them, at least for me tonight was that I thought they were tackling pretty well. For the most part, <laughs> I think a couple times. Outside I, of Dion missing <laughs> yeah. the running back, yeah. Yeah, outside of that. But I thought Fabian made a couple nice open field tackles that we were even talking mm-hmm. about. Um, so I, I thought they tackled a lot better. But obviously that pick, that should have been down there. Yeah. That I can't get out of my mind. And down there I'm pointing to the end zone, Washington's end zone. We're still at the stadium. Um, when TJ, that was TJ Green who yeah. was there. Yeah. And the ball he was got in. boxed out almost. Yep. But Full the, on box out, but, yeah. But yeah, and in his defense, there were also, you know, three other defenders right. uh, in the area who were just kind of watching this this happen. Mm-hmm. It was I, – I don't know the word for the moment. I don't know. They were they were all expecting someone else to, yeah. to get the ball. But somebody's got to make a play on that. 
and I think that would have helped seal the game there. So, yeah, at the end, then Foyer mentioned it, and then um, Coach Smith also mentioned it. So it was obviously a point of emphasis for them probably post-game. or they, they all knew how much that mattered. And you really, um, you really have to look at what the defense was able to – they had so many opportunities to kind of shut this – shut this game down to come out of this with a W and ultimately it just there were too many opportunities that were left out there and that's how you lose games like this right that, right. that like that's how things get out of hand and you feel like you could seal it and ultimately you know they just weren't able to do that I, I thought defensively they had some nice pockets of of play I thought the pass rush wasn't altogether terrible but you you let Taylor get out and make some runs and slide and ultimately all those missed opportunities, you make one. You make one, this game has changed. Mm -hmm. you, and they had several of them that they weren't able to come through with. So. Yeah, I mean, that was my entire like post-game takeaways was mm -hmm. just I, – I made the comment. I was like – in the when I was writing, I was like, you know, it's like a flood. You know, a flood starts with one drop of rain, and then it just accumulates over a larger period of time, and then all of a sudden you're like knee deep in water. Right. That's right. really what the Falcons kind of had to go through at this point. It wasn't just one thing that it's like, oh, like it, you know, this happened, and we need to get better here. It was an accumulation of a lot of different things over the course of four quarters. For sure, and that's why I think it could drive you insane if yeah. you, if you're a player foyer his body language told me like he couldn't believe what just happened yeah. like yeah. it seemed like there was kind of this inner not aggression but he was just like like how did that happen like he it just just couldn't wrap his mind around it at the time yeah and ultimately i think that that's why this game is is, is gonna stick with them and we're gonna talk in the next quarter about hey you know, how can they move forward? How can they not let this bleed into the next game? But that's why it's got to be so frustrating. And that's why I ultimately, and I tried to write this too, that, hey, like the fans that were here, the fans that invested their time and money in this product, like they have a right to be frustrated. The players have a right to be frustrated because there were so many opportunities. One other thing goes right and, and this thing is sealed. And that's why I'm with you, Chris. There was a lot of times where I felt like Falcons got this one. Right, mm -hmm. that that I really felt that way, and I thought you made a great point too. I thought the score was was I had my it was a lot different than who we right. thought it was. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that that it felt bigger. It felt like the Falcons really took control in that third quarter, and then ultimately it you know it it, it kind of leaks out, and that's why I think it's fair that we that we look at the offensive series, we look at the defense. Special teams gives up a hundred and one yard kickoff right. a return yeah. for a yeah. touchdown. Yeah. That there's plenty of of, of blame to to uh, go around. Uh, for this disappointing loss. And we're on to quarter number four with what's a very important question now that this uh, game is uh, in the rear view, and that's where do the Falcons go from here? They have an upcoming game against the New York Jets. That's another very winnable game. It's also in the United Kingdom, and that adds a whole number of, of complications. And a good question that, that Tori wrote down here, how does Arthur Smith make sure this loss doesn't linger? That that's an important thing to look at as we move forward. Um, any suggestions? Any uh, insight about how he, about how he might go about this? Given everything that we've heard from him after previous losses, um, any thoughts about about how he can get this team forward and avoid having one loss turning turn into two or maybe more? Yeah, I think that's like so important when we're talking about the difference in what Arthur Smith is trying to put together here, because I think there are too many times that losses lingered in previous regi regimes and in previous seasons. I think that was a very, very big issue in 2020. I think that's why you saw the losses accumulate the way that they did. It almost, I wrote one time, I was like, it feels like this is the identity of this team. So the fact that Arthur Smith can has an opportunity to come in here and be like, okay, this happened. It looked a lot like last year. I know you. a lot of you were there. I know a lot of you felt this way. Let's figure out how to nip this right in the bud because that's so important for this era and what Arthur Smith is trying to put together in Atlanta. He has to be able to get this team in a good headspace going to London, which is weird in and of itself to, to that London game, but to have to play that game after a loss like this, it's like there's a lot riding on this week 
especially kind of heading into the bye week after. They, I, th- I just feel very, very strongly that this is a really, really important time for Arthur Smith to really get a hold of this team and really put his stamp on it to kind of be like, look, I know this wasn't good, but like we have got to figure out a way to make sure it doesn't happen again and really and truly like make this team feel that way. Because it's one thing to say that it, because I feel like, you know, previous coaching staff had said, had said that before too. You've really got to make this team feel like this is different. Yeah. I, I guess I would say the I think the thinking about the questions a little, a little bit t- hard for me because I think, Nobody wants to lose, right? Like, nobody's yeah. trying. You know what I mean? Like yeah, no, it's not like they're coming out being like, hey, let's lose. Yeah, yeah, like, no one's really trying to lose. And, like, I think there's only so much you can say as a coach to your team to say, guys, I don't want to lose. You don't mm-hmm. want to lose. We are better than this. You know, how many different ways can you say that? I think at the end of the day, it's about having the leaders in the locker room who guys respect along with you, who I think – believe in your message who also are are bringing the message so guys who people respect in the locker room who are also saying that message and saying you know trust trust what coach smith is doing there's a plan stick to the plan we we just made a mistake here it's not we don't need to reinvent the wheel here we just Mm -hmm. made a mistake here trust what he's doing i think if he has those people that people respect from you know eric harris or matt ryan or lee smith deron guys like that who are also in the locker room talking to their position groups and let, and reinforcing what the coach is saying. Mm-hmm. We, we're better than this and we can move forward. I, I think that's that's the way to go about it. And then just preach it to the team, execution, because limiting mistakes. And that, and I think that's all you can do because, you know, giving a speech and, and all that is great. But mm-hmm. at the end of the day, you need to execute. Mm-hmm. And say, he, he's going to say all the right things, as he, as he has been since training camp. But I, I think it's just about executing it and making sure that the message is uniform from the from the top down. Yeah, and I I think that Matt, during his press conference at at the very end, he talked about being proactive to make sure that the right mindset and the right attitudes and the right, uh, you know, not techniques, but but that this team was doing what was necessary to prepare well for the Jets game and to continue, really, let's be honest, they they started the season with two pretty rough games, found a way to come back in that week three opportunity. Maybe they didn't build on week three right away like they were hoping, but we don't know where this team is going to go from here. The bottom line is that I I go back to what Arthur Smith said earlier this week after that Giants uh, victory in his Monday press conference, and he was basically like, look, can we make the next step? Can we make the next step? Maybe they stumbled a bit. That doesn't mean that they're going to stop walking, right? right. That, that Can they make that next step? Can they get a little bit better? So heading into the bye, they feel like these are areas where we improved and these are fixable areas where we can continue to improve. This is a long season. This season's going to have ups and downs. That's what happens with new. Um, but ultimately, I think if they can continue making that type of progress, make this game more of an aberration, make the Giants game, at least in the fourth quarter, uh, more uh, more of, of, of what we see in the future, that that's how you uh, have to respond moving forward. Thanks, everybody, for joining the Falcons Final Whistle podcast after a disappointing result for the home team, a 34-30 to loss to the Washington football team. And thanks, as always, to Microsoft Windows 11 for the sponsorship. And now it's up to you guys. Head over to iTunes, Spotify. Subscribe, please. That would be nice. Leave a rating. We'd prefer it to be five stars, I think. How about a review? Um, some nice words would be greatly appreciated and Keep on coming back because we are going to have Falcons Final Whistle podcast after every single game as we uh, chronicle the course of this 2020 season. There's been a lot of ups. There's been a lot of downs. It's never dull. Always interesting with this Falcons team, and we'll see what happens next. We'll talk to you next week. 